right, so can anyone hear me? <laughs> Wasn't meant to be a joke. Does this help or does it make it worse? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay, um, hello, my name is Richard Hughes. I work for the desktop group in the UK. I apologize for my voice. I blame the cheap Czech beer. Um, <laughs> I've worked for Red Hat for about five years. I've worked on color stuff, packaging stuff, all that kind of thing as well. Um, and so I no, <laughs> I really no. I'll, I'll whisper even louder. So um, I've worked on package stuff. I've worked on color stuff. Um, I've been doing software stuff for a little while now. Uh, and this is my presentation about GNOME software. Now, what we've had before is package kit, and a lot of what we showed users was complete crap. We asked users to, to understand really complex things, like to update Firefox requires to update XUL Runner, which might bring in random other things. And it's, it was just a really horrible thing we were exposing the user to. We're making them wait to download metadata. Now, my wife, my mom, my dad doesn't know what metadata is. They don't understand why it takes minutes to download stuff before they can search for things. It's, just, it's an arbitrary thing they don't understand. And we have all these massive dependencies. We're rebuilding applications all the time. Uh, and we're, we're, we're making users uh, download megabytes and megabytes and megabytes for essentially updates they don't need, updates that don't make any sense whatsoever. And then when things do go wrong, because we're building a system full of a bag of bits rather than a cohesive base system and application model, we're telling them things like text live latex, bin bin to SVN, some random number wasn't installed, which to me means nothing. And I'm, I've been in software for, for a decade, so to, some, to an end user, we should not be showing this kind of random stuff. Uh, similarly, pub, pub, uh, public key cryptography, why should I explain what GP is to my parents just so they can click yes on a dialogue they're going to click yes to anyway? So this was the first thing we showed users when they tried to search for software in, say, Fedora 17, 18, etc. It was a dialogue with some kind of things they might have seen or heard of. They might not know what other games are, but they don't know what anything else is. And we're showing them a loading bar, and we're waiting in a queue. Now, there's no such thing as a queue when you install software. A queue is just the implementation that's gone wrong because we're doing something that we probably shouldn't do. And it was a really bad first experience. Um, and really just wasn't good enough for uh, the GNOME 3 and the kind of the, the more slick UI we are after. So over the years, now it might keep the same strange for a package kit maintainer, but it seems strange to me saying packages aren't that interesting. Packages are an implementation detail. They use them to install an app, use them to build a core OS or something. Don't expose them to users. Users just don't care about packages. In Fedora 19 and 20, we've worked on this thing called offline updates, where all the up updates are downloaded ahead of time, depth solved, and all prepared. So that actually up to actually do the update, you just reboot. Uh, it does it all kind of semi-atomically, um, and it magically works. The big disadvantage is you have to reboot um, rather than keep doing it live. So we sort of sat down and we sort of thought, how can we make this better? How can we take away the dependency of packages? And how can we use other things that traditionally aren't applications? Maybe something like an add-on. So GNOME software was created and creates these meta-application things, things that don't have to be backed by packages. So an application could be backed by a package. It could be backed by three packages, or it could be backed by no packages whatsoever. And to do this, we created this plugin structure where um, the UI would say to all the plugins, can you return all the applications you have that are installed? So we can go to package and say, okay, well, that package will return all the, all the packages that are installed that happen to be applications. And then we'll go to the next plugin and it will say, to, say for instance, Epiphany and say, what web uh, applications have you got installed? And it will add to the list. And then as soon as that's done, which is done all in threads and stuff, it returns to the UI and it's all super quick. Um, similarly, once we've got that list of applications, we can then refine that list, another action that GNOME software does. Uh, where you might refine it and say, actually, I've got the list of applications, but I want to know what ratings they have. I'd like to see some screenshots. Um, I'd like to see other details as well, which might be more expensive to get than the initial list, so we don't do them by default. 
Now, plugins, you can add and remove plugins, uh, build time, run time, et cetera. And the idea is you can, say for Fedora, you could use certain plugins, and for SUSE, you could use something else, Debian, et cetera. So the actual details aren't terribly interesting. The, the only thing to bear in mind is that there is a framework where magic stuff kind of happens and then applications pop out. Now, I guess it's a good time now to say that an application, as far as I'm concerned, it, it, it's, it's a massively overloaded thing. So you could argue that PowerTop is an application or Vim is an application or Postgres is an application. From my point of view, I'm using the AppStream definition of application, which is it has a desktop file and it would be visible in the menus, which is kind of quite a restrictive definition. And there are some things that we do want to show in the software center, which are an application, which we, we're calling add-ons, which might be things like fonts, codecs, that kind of sort of more interesting things are interesting to the user, but isn't traditionally an application. But I'll, I'll say more about that in a minute. So this is the, the um, uh, UI itself. But what I might do is actually just j jump to a live demo, which is faster. Let me, let's try a demo, an unrehearsed demo. This is probably more interesting than looking at a slide. Okay. This is a big fat no. Okay, let's stick to the slides. Um, <laughs> the demo gods. So this is the overview page, the very first thing we show the user. So at the top we have three tabs, all installed and updates. Um, uh, three like modes of the application. The big featured thing are things that we think are really awesome applications that we want to feature prominently. Um, and picks might be things that are, uh, in Fedora 20 we just had like a, a fixed list which we kind of generated for everyone. Fedora 21 we want to have a more kind of dynamic list where the picks that we return are, if you, if you have lots of games installed you'll probably be more interested in other games or if you have say, I don't know, GVim installed the Emacs desktop might actually be interesting as well. Um, we also have this category view where you, it's basically a simplified version of the menu. So you can drill down and say, I just want a game um, um, of, of a different type. It's How do you unmaximize this? The demo gods are at work. How do you maximize Nivins? So the installed view is showing you only applications that you have installed on your system. So we don't actually show any package information here at all. Now there's, there's different stars as well. So the gray stars are the stars that we've um, generated for the user. So we've, we've used other users from their ratings and generated, say, BRT at all. They've given maybe, was it a, a, a three and a half out of five? Um, and the yellow stars are things I've rated. The UI will only let you rate the application if it's installed. You can't just go through, for instance, all the KDE apps that you haven't got installed and say, yeah, awesome, 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 awesome. Um, all this data goes up to the distro rather than these sort of uh, known. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And the updates view. In the updates view, you look at it in Fedora 20 and 21. It's showing you the applications, uh, each one with an update description. Um, and there's a one single update, a very top thing that it's quite important to show users updates of things that aren't applications, things like if you have a PowerTop update or a glibc update, we've just lumped them together into a meta application called OS updates, which you can drill through and find out all the update details. Um, you'll also notice the add-ons here. So we're classing add-ons as like first class kind of applications. So here's, there's a, uh, an, a, an uh, input engine um, for my uh, chewing and also a font. Um, go for it. Uh, 
So, oh, you mean top right restarting? So, the top right restart and install will actually um, log you out. Or the shell will come up saying if you actually want to shut down now. You say shut down. What will then happen is F, in F20 and F21 is you shut down the PC, shuts down hard, reboots back up. System D, we, we've a little, a little like a trigger thing in System D, so that it notices the update has been set up, everything's downloaded and ready to go. It sets up a very small environment to do the update that's kind of small, self-contained, well-tested, does the update, then reboots again, which takes you back up into your proper system. The idea being is we wanted to make a very small system that we've tested, that we know the update is not going to fail on. We know that randomly losing network halfway through isn't going to corrupt stuff. Um, it's like a known working good system. The alternative we did consider was when you do shutdown um, uh, and install updates, was you actually um, the update live. Um, you could have loaded some random glibs um, GTK module type override that will cause horrendous problems when you do the live update and then you reboot. It doesn't. We wanted a really small self-contained system. The other alternative we, we're, we're kind of also playing with is having a separate partition, which is um, up, like which is always available um, that we can use for offline updates as well, more like the Chrome model. Um, there's lots of stuff we can do there. At the moment, the system, D, um, uh, system solution works really well. We have very few failures with it. Um, but yeah, to answer the question. Cool. Um, the category view I talked about, which is why if you typed, if you clicked on the games on the overview, it will show you all the, the different types of games, uh, give you some ratings and that kind of thing. Um, now you, you notice all the the icons there and the description, the short descriptions. These are actually being extracted from the packages themselves, and we're actually shipping a tiny blob of XML that we're reading, so we can get all this uh, information and all the icons and stuff before the app is installed. With GNOME Package Kit, we had the problem where you couldn't get the icon until we actually installed the program. So you, you, now we're in a situation where we can, we have the application data available to us, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. So here's an, an example of an application that ships some screenshots. Now we, we want to support videos as well because sometimes a screenshot just isn't, isn't enough to sort of showcase your application. Sometimes a game, a, 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 a 20 second video can show you more than 100 pictures. Um, so here you just have little small thumbnails on the right, a large thumbnail, you can just cho choose, the, uh, choose the image. And the, there's a long description, and this long description, there's only a, a, um, a couple of paragraphs here, but some applications can do five paragraphs, do some lists, numbered lists, unordered lists. So you can actually make a, a, a more cohesive kind of web store. Um, one thing to notice is all the, all the screenshots all have the same aspect ratio. We've, we've chosen sort of 16 by 9 to match YouTube. Um, and just by saying to the upstreams, can you please use the same aspect ratio? It means that when you go between pages in the software center, things don't jump around and padding doesn't randomly appear. But it just means you have to be a little bit more careful when you, when you uh, take the screenshots of 16 by 9. One hand up there. Are you asking a question or is that just a wave? Just a wave. Okay. Um, now, because we've got all this data available st to us before ahead of time, we can do some quite clever stuff without having to do things like hit the RPM DB and download metadata and all that kind of stuff. So in the shell in um, 3.12, you just type in tux, and within 20 milliseconds or whatever it is, you get three entries, one, two, three, extreme tux, rake, tux racer, tux commander, tux guitar. Now, that's a really good way of installing an application. If you thought you had something installed and you type it in, it it, rather than it not appearing in the overview, you can just click on it, one more click, and you're installed. Um, and it will, it'll, hopefully for 3.12, uh, it'll work really well. Um, now, I kind of alluded to the fact that we've got this extra metadata. And this is kind of the, the devil in the detail. So we have these the sort of three um, uh, horizontal sections, the bottom being the Compose server. So think of this something like Koji. So the logic is the application uh, upstream is really just a tarball, typically. Uh, and inside the tarball, there'll be a desktop file, there'll be an app data XML file, which is the long description, the screenshots, uh, project affiliation, that kind of stuff. Um, and in, in the tarball itself, it probably might have translations because you actually have to build the packet, build the tarball to get the translations out of it and get everything merged together. So what we do is we, we build, the, the idea long term will be that we build the, uh, the package on Koji which spits out a binary RPM, we take that binary RPM, we explode it if it has a desktop file, 
and extract any data from the desktop file, app data file, Bob, uh, and, and a little tarball full of icons. Um, now, currently, that's not on Koji. Currently, that's I've got a serve underneath my stairs, which I run once a week. So it's not it's not a great scalable solution, but there's it's not a million miles to be able to push this onto the Fedora infrastructure. The next sort of layer up is it's sort of like the more mirror and the, the, the server side of things. So you can imagine on a mirror, we already have the existing metadata like primary XML and update info and that kind of stuff. And all I'm really asking the mirror people to do is add two more files. One's like, uh, like fedora20.appdata.xml, one might be fedora20-icons.tar.gz. Um, the, the former being, I think, five megabytes and the second being like 20 megabytes. It's really not a big extra load on the, on the mirrors. Um, and also on this layer, we have this thing called Fedora Tagger, which is a pretty awesome web app that we can use to add uh, a meta information about packages. We can add, uh, put the ratings there. We can have statistics so that we know how many people install an application, how many people remove an application on their first thing they do. Um, and this is all kind of tied together by the software center. Package gets still downloading all the primary package type gumpf, the uninteresting implementation stuff. But we've now got access to the software center to the app stream data um, directly. So we don't have to go through package for every single request, which means we can return results super quick. Um, and I've also included Epiphany here. So Epiphany is we're using for web apps. We just got to use it in its like no Chrome mode. Um, now there's some debate whether we should support the Google Chrome as well um, for their web apps. Um, and that would be literally a case of writing uh, one C file, which becomes a plugin, which would return all the uh, applications and that Chrome knows about or uh, is available. Um, and it's not an un un it's not a controversial change. You just need to put some, put some of the, the um, hacky scripts and push it upstream into Koji and Mash and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not a web app guy by a long shot. Yeah, so that's one of the concerns we had initially when we when we first started the project with AppStream. We developed it with a few guys at SUSE and Ubuntu, et cetera. Um, the proposal was to use the open collaboration server so that you could have, like, uh, you wouldn't want ratings on L being visible to other customers who are using SUSE or whatever and vice versa. Um, now. For Fedora, Fedora Tagger works well. I don't see a problem with having a private instance. My question would be, is it possible to have ratings and reviews on RHEL software? But it's, it, it, at the moment, the Fedora Tagger integration is one URL and a couple of methods. It's, 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 it would be so trivial to change that URL to something even local, some LAN or whatever, you know? Um, uh, and, and from a, a GNOME software point of view, it, the implementation is you just call a few methods, you get some data back. There's no kind of, there's no magic there. Um, so I, I, I talked about app data. Now, existing applications ship this thing called a desktop file, which most people probably know about already. Uh, and it basically says, look, this is the icon. Uh, this is a sh like a one-line description. Um, and uh, this is how you run it. Now, we had the option of either pushing stuff into the desktop file um, and extending the format for a software center. We had an option of creating something slightly different. Now, we wanted this, and we wanted a separate file format really because it, in some instances you may want a different description menu in the software center. So you could argue that uh, in, the, in the menus for GNOME, you might want to have web for epiphany as a short description, but you could in the want to have epiphany brackets for gnome or something so you can override the name the summary all this kind of stuff and the other argument for having a, a, a separate file format the xml rather than st sticking in a, in a in a desktop file was it's really hard to do multi-line formatted uh, in a single line of desktop we, we tried it and it got to the point where um, you're using like um, a bit of random bits of html or this random stuff we're trying to squeeze into the desktop file, which made it impossible to translate, and it was just a giant hack. So we decided to spin out a whole new file, which led to all this other stuff, like screenshots uh, and in the future videos, 
and the fact that we can make, uh, have all these extra attributes uh, um, that we can add by just by just the, 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 the format of this data thing. So I could say like for um, GNOME software, I've got compulsory for desktop GNOME, which means it doesn't show up in the software center if you're running the GNOME desktop because it's an integral part. It doesn't, it's, it, you, you can't remove it. You, you can still find it. You can't remove it because it's a, a, a central bit. bit. Um, but if you run the software center on KDE, it would show up. So we can add all this inf like meta information in, in the file itself. Um, the only th thing to know about this is that there is a, a tool called um, App Data Validate in the App Data Tools project, which goes through, if you write one of these files, it goes through, checks your basic syntax, checks that you stick to the style guide. Like the style guide's like, write somewhere between three and five paragraphs, don't go over this, don't have a paragraph that's too long, don't have more than five screenshots. And it's kind of a good way of having some sort of consistency in the App Store. Now, this is what happens when things go wrong. So if an upstream application refuses to ship an app data file, and they even ship a SVG icon, which uses loads of random stuff, which means we can't render it in SR, SRG, uh, SR, you know what I mean, the renderer. Um, we just get a really blank thing. Now, Megatech, with a summary of Play Megatech, I've got no idea what this game does. I've got no idea if it's any good. There's no rating, there's no reviews, there's nothing. So my proposal for F22 is that we don't show applications like this. Applications upstream that don't supply the extra the user can't make a good decision about whether it's a good app or a bad app. And so it's no point us showing the sad apps when we have already, I think it's 11% of applications have reduced this extra file upstream. 11% doesn't sound that much. Through analysis, you can kind of work out that 80% of, the, of the software in Fedora that we consider application is dead upstream. Shipping so much stuff that we shouldn't. It's just dead upstream software that, that just, just hangs on between Fedora and monkey patches it to do something and make it old and it just gets auto built at every release. And that's probably not something we want to show the users on in a software center. We want to show high quality applications with good integration that adhere to the, the human interface guidelines and all this kind of stuff. So my proposal for F22 is we just don't show this kind of stuff, which is slightly controversial. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I totally agree. So the, the, the comment was that just because it's not been updated doesn't mean it's not useful. Now, for an application, now my, my view on this is for an application that's using like a high-level toolkit with applications, if an application has not been upstream released in five years, it's highly likely it's not had any translations in five years, and it's not had any bug fixes in five years. And if the user installs it, finds a bug, and reports the bug, nothing's going to happen. So I would say that's not high-quality software. What there is an option of is if you have an application like Mega Mech, Mega Mech, which you know is awesome, upstreams complete, there's not meant to be any translation, and upstream a ship file, ship the update file in the spec file, just use it as a uh, reference in the source, let the Fedora packager um, write the file, which takes 10 minutes, um, and then save it. You, we kind of have like a, like a best of breed thing where the, where the maintainers that care about the abandoned applications will save them and the applications that really are dire just will not be known and disappear. Um, so I've talked about, about what we're doing for Fedora 21 um, and what we've done for Fedora 20. Fedora 20 was really designed as like a preview release. F21 is more like meat on the bone. Uh, and for F22, we want to integrate even even more with the desktop. So uh, in Totem or whatever videos now, when you try and play a file, uh, like an MP3 codec, it kind of tries to get like a random visualization. It pops up some modal dialog, which says we need some random codec with some random name. It loads metadata down. It, it's a really rubbish user experience. But if we can know in the application before, ahead of time, rather than, so we can do it proactively rather than reactive, react, uh, reactively, we can do a much better UX and UI. So an example would be for, for software, uh, for, for videos to be able to say, this codec I know requires, th th this, this file requires this codec, therefore I'll, I'll ask for it before. Um, another example might be in, in no music when you import your catalog. 
Um, and you, you import OGs and your FLAC and all the stuff we support. And then you import MP3s. It knows already that we can't play that. And so we could say at this point, we can't play your whole collection. Click here, find it in software. That's kind of where we hit issues with the whole legal, we can't point to non-free stuff. Um, and I'm hoping with the whole desktop workstation thing, we can find some sort of solution that's both legal and has an awesome UX. Um, but it's, it's kind of yet another controversial point. So I, I, we talked a little bit about Fedora Tiger. Um, we, we really only use like a small fraction of what Fedora Tiger can do. So for Fedora, 12, uh, for Fedora 21, Every time you uh, install an application, it will send a request saying someone else installed the application. If you remove something, it will send a request saying someone else removed this application. So then we can start getting some stats together about, okay, you application installed might also be interested in this application. At the moment, we're kind of guessing. We haven't really got any like hard stats to make any, any sort of better predictions. Um, we're also using it at the moment for star ratings. So if three people in the audience all vote an application 100 percent the 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 viewing application will be 100 percent so it's really just an average it's a very simple metric and in the future we'll weight that more heavily so that applications need to have um have a, a, a more frequent uh, update schedule to it more than say four stars and must conform to either the kde or the gnome before they can get five stars so we're going to put all sorts of limitations and make the the single essentially a, a value the number of stars a slight useful thing than just kind of popularity contest um but for the moment we're using fedora tagger for that and it works really well the downside is it's only really available for fedora not because we're being evil using the package name which is not which is distribution um kind of specific even release specific so to, for a more generic solution that might be hard and also not sure that people would want to um, compare say for instance uh, uh, I have gnome on Debian stable with I have gnome on Fedora 21 it's, 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 it's a different product um, the future is we want to uh, integrate more with the user system so we want to actually have user registration as one of the uh, initial first user steps so this would mean the user gets a, 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 a FAS account now, if we have a FAS account and we know what software we've installed uh, and they re reinstall their machine, say, six months later, we can offer to reinstall the stuff they did on th in the first time they installed Fedora. That'd be a really useful thing to have. We can also say, okay, well, if from your FAS account, people that you, you interact with installed application Y and therefore say, okay, well, because you've in, you, because you have X installed and someone you know has Y, maybe Y might be good for you too. So we can start to do some more clever stuff, but we can't do this without some sort of account system. Um, now this isn't, uh, it's already, you can already do this in Tagger now, it's, it, 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 this kind of stuff kind of is 99% there. What we need to do is do the UI for it. Now I, don't think, I think we've basically run out of time for uh, uh, 312 at this point and for 21, uh, but for 22 I'm hoping we have a, like a proper um, account system store arbitrary data in. Another thing that the account system would be useful for is if I'd be mad um, rating all my applications and then I reinstall my system, I'd be So if I stored my ratings on, on, on Tagger, it'd be quite a useful thing um, to be, when I reinstall for them to just appear magically. Um, so I'm kind of get, getting a bit more demanding now. So things that actually need doing. So we need to do the Koji integrations so that uh, the tables, uh, so the, the RPMs come off the Koji, get a, a script run against them, the data pops out, and then we use them on the mirrors. It is not scalable, me doing it on a server underneath my stairs. I do that once a week. It really needs to happen every day. Um, another thing that we need to do is we need to start keeping uh, metadata and packages on the mirrors for longer. Software works so quick without waiting for the metadata because it uses any version of the metadata. Is that if you if um, ret return the list of software, you have 200 milliseconds to do it. Any version of the metadata is better than no metadata because you can't download, say, five megabytes of files in 200 milliseconds. So the consequence of that is the user finds something that's interesting, goes to install it, and then the package isn't on the mirror anymore because of the newer version. So therefore, we have to re-download the metadata, 
refine the package, and then actually install it. Um, you could argue that's a good thing from a security update point of view, but most of the time these aren't security updates. And we could even have a checks for this, so we only update, we only download the security information and only re-download metadata um, if it's an issue. We did some stats on this and actually found that keeping the packages and the metadata on the mirrors for an extra couple of weeks would actually lower our disk space uh, and um, uh, amount of bandwidth we used because we wouldn't be downloading the metadata so often. If you look at the stats for most of the mirrors now, 40% of their traffic is downloading metadata rather than packages, which is just crazy because metadata is meant to be small, self-contained stuff that points to big things. Um, so that, that's another sort of suggestion. Um, with the Koji and MASH type integration, we, I do need some help from the Fedora RelEng people, whoever you are. Um, it basically needs someone to take my code, make it production quality, deploy it on the servers, and I can't really do that. So we still have some very big open questions with GNOME software as well. Do we want per user applications? So that's per user, a good example would be is, I want to run the development Firefox build for last night, but I don't want to install it on my system system wide because when my wife uses my laptop, she's gonna have some crashy, buggy Firefox. She wants the stable version. Um, so then we have to work out, okay, do we want uh, a user version and a system version, or do we completely decouple uh, a system version completely? So. We have portals, uh, which is Leonard's proposal. We have bundles, which Alex has worked on before. Um, so we need this way of doing a, a base OS and applications. And there's, there's so many open questions, we just don't know yet. Um, and again, uh, like I alluded to before, do we want to share applications that are poor quality? I would argue no. And my proposal is for F22, um, i.e. we give people a year to write a So what I need to do right now, there's lots of things that we're doing really badly. Like you must write the update file. If you have an application for Dora, which ships a desktop file, and the upstream hasn't, you really need to do is write the file, send it to upstream. Now, upstream's far preferable because all the translation could be done by the same team that are familiar with the package. You don't all the, the Fedora doing the translation, then Debian doing the translation, then Suze doing the translation. You can do it all upstream where it really belongs. Upstream can then decide, okay, well, we've made a, a game. Now we've made a game uh, a menu editor, so we want to change the description for the App Store. So they're in complete control of what screenshots they show and that kind of stuff. That's kind of where it belongs. But the alternative is a dead upstream or an upstream that doesn't care about Linux distribution. In which case we just say, okay, ship it in the spec, uh, reference in the spec file, install it and use a share up data. So another problem we have is a lot of the applications have been rated by about four people. Now you can't do much stats when you have such limited data. So I'd, I'd kind of like everyone to install um, num software from Rawhide on a VM or something, go through their install application, just think, because unless we have kind of averaged out, we can't really get a true picture. We could have like a, a KDE a guy that goes around voting 100% KDE and 1% every, everything can own, or vice versa. But with enough people, that affects kind of kind of equals out. Another sort of pet peeve of mine is update descriptions. Our update descriptions vary between um, fixes, bug, one, two, three, four, five, in lower case with no links, to packages basically writing small novels in their update descriptions. Um, when you compare one against the other, it's just not a cohesive view on the in the updates tab. We need to have something like where, for rel where we say um, this is this this update updates two packages um, uh, for bug fix reasons. These are the bugs that it fixes. These are the extra links. So doing something uh, more simply, more carefully and have less updates would have a much better. Um, um, experience when you actually come to review them. Because if you're just looking at a list of random updates with lots of random words and random numbers, you're in no position to choose whether you want to apply the update or not. You, th you could think, okay, well, I've got a, a 15 megabyte data plan. Do I want to waste it on a security update or do I want to waste it on a random kernel update? Um, so they can do very quickly. So I'm going to stop talking because I kind of have to stop speaking. Otherwise, I'm going to pass out. Um, 
I, I'm interested to all questions, uh, criticisms, worries, anything. So please, anyone. Yeah. So the question was basically, does anyone except GNOME care about our pizza? Now, if like a, um, which I can uh, link to later, um, it shows that I think 54% of GNOME applications ship this app data file, um, and 11% of applications are in Fedora. Now, obviously, that includes a lot of things like games, uh, LibreOffice, all that kind of um, uh, are useful applications do ship it. And it is true that I think one KDE application ships app data. I think it's Kate or K3B or one of the, one of them, right? Um, the issue K KDE have is with the with the with the with the file format is that it doesn't work for with their translation system they have. Um, so XML can be used, you can use any little tool with it. Uh, have PO files, but most projects are very familiar with. And KDE do something slightly different. All KDE have to do is fix their um, desktop file translation tool to work with app data and it will work very well but then with KDE it's chicken and egg GNOME can see the point in writing that data description because it shows in GNOME software which is used on the GNOME desktop in KDE you have this thing called APA which only really uses some of the app data and doesn't really do it very well so there's no kind of requirement to do it um, what I would hope that maybe the Fedora KDE packages could push some of it upstream to KDE so they'll put some pressure on um, Otherwise, they are going to start going from the App Store unintentionally. Oh, otherwise, was an applications. You know, it's not an ideal situation, but someone has to do the work. Um, next question. So. So the question was basically, is there a library or something that lets you interface with the AppStream? There is something called Lib AppStream, um, that we don't actually use in GNOME software, which is an upstream uh, kind of project developed by one of the contributors. It's more alpha quality code. Really low level, just for performance reasons, it has to start in 200 milliseconds. We have to do a query in 20 milliseconds, it has to be super quick. Um, Realistically, it's not that hard to pass. It's a very simple XML file format. And so if you've, or you've got an expat dependency already, you can blitz through it in milliseconds. Is about a performance issue, or are you worried about just a binding issue? Yeah, sure. So AppStream is, uh, never been an API break in AppStream. So we've, we've added loads of stuff. And like we Data. We will add loads more stuff. We'll add videos, we'll um, like the donation links, that kind of random stuff. But we're never going to break backwards. We're only going to break. We're only going to go forwards. Cool. Next question. Okay, downgrading is really hard. So th with packages, downgrading can break horribly. So when you do an upgrade, an upgrade in a postscript can change a database format in a, in a, in a compatible way. So downgrading won't actually run the scriptlet backwards. So in package it's, it's an explicit rule that we don't allow users to downgrade. Another good reason is we don't want them to downgrade to a library that has a security vulnerability which lets them exploit code and become root. Um, so I think that's a different question. So you want almost a, a better model might be something like a Collins model where you've got an OS tree OS image where you want to go back to your existing state which might include things like databases and that kind of thing or maybe even like a ButterFS snapshot which is probably a better way of doing it than trying to roll back packages because rollback if you're doing like a power top version one to power top version it's highly likely that rollback is going to work but if you're updating something like um, say for instance uh, glib2 
you might have to download new versions of um, GTK3 uh, applications, and then downgrading the library requires downgrading half your system. So that becomes a really, really tricky problem. I think it's still a good thing that it's possible in the command line. I don't think we should put it in the UI. So I think, I think that's, we're banned on qu questions now. So thank you very much for listening. Sorry for my voice. Uh, any questions, grab me off. Thank you.